Hello there and welcome to Iceland. It is May 30th, about 6.30 in the morning here in Iceland. I am in a hotel room. Uh, I fly out this morning in a few hours, but I wanted to throw together a quick update on the eruption that began yesterday. I was obviously absent from uh, any sort of videos or YouTube presence or whatever, and that's because I was out on the Isle of Heime in the Vestman Islands with the group that I've been taking on a trip here so we were I was kind of stuck out there it really wasn't much I could do uh, to monitor the eruption and report it as well so just finishing this trip and wasn't able to do as much as I could normally do so thank you for all those who inquired of me and wondered if I was doing okay um, of course I was tracking as best I could during the day and the great irony here is I, I really can almost you know track the eruption and give you better information about it if I'm home in Idaho <laughs> versus being here in Iceland. The access to the site was very locked down. Uh, I wasn't able to pull any strings and get any closer than than anyone else could. So the so even though I'm here in Iceland, there's the best we can do, the best I can do is look at the webcams, look at the data just like you can back at home. So we did get to stop, our group did get to stop along the road to the airport last night and see uh, the glow from a distance. We could see part of the fissures, part of the fountaining that was taking place. One member of our group had a spotting scope, so that was really helpful to see it a little bit closer. Um, and all the participants were thrilled, which was great. Um, personally, like I know what it looks like to get up close, and so I was a little wistful and uh, you know, wishing I could get a little bit closer than I could. But nonetheless, this is going to be a really quick update on what transpired yesterday and my take on things. I haven't had a chance to look at all the data, all the, all the webcam views as I was out on the island most of the day, um, but I'll put together what I can here. And I apologize if this is a little, little scattered and a little um, different than maybe in polishes what my, I might normally do. So the eruption began yesterday on the 29th at about 12:45 uh, p.m. It was just a little bit east of the Blue Lagoon, right in the same area where we'd seen the prior eruptions uh, come up. And in fact, this this view here of the eruption as it it sits now, it's actually cut through. This is you might recognize this little site here. I believe I believe this is our cute little spatter cone from the eruption that began on March 16th and persisted into April. The, the new fissure cut through, not perfectly along, uh, a little bit at a little bit of an angle, I believe, to the fissures from the last eruption. So uh, just as, you know, the, the greatest probability was that it was going to erupt pretty much in the same area as those last few eruptions, and that's exactly what transpired. Um, there was some seismic activity preceding the eruption, so they're able to get people out of Grindavik and the Blue Lagoon evacuated. So the good news is no one was harmed. Uh, more good news is that uh, for now we have no uh, damage in Grindavik. The, the defensive berms have done well at holding back the lava flows that have moved south towards the town. I'll show that here in a second. Um, what else do I have here? I'll show you some of the, we'll start with the actual eruption itself and some of the footage from that and then at the end of the update we'll loop back to some of the precursor signs. We'll look at exactly what the earthquake showed and look at the deformation data and a few other things. Um, let's see what else do I have here. So the fissure at its peak um, it lengthened to about three and a half kilometers uh, which is pretty significant and the output from this thing looks to have been greater than the prior eruptions which kind of makes sense because we had stored up about 20 million cubic meters of magma so the the volume of magma that was available for the eruption was greater than we'd had in some of the prior eruptions um, the output of lava at the peak somewhere around 1500 cubic meters per second and we'll get to the met office update as well which might give us some better numbers there and let's see um, and thanks as always to Amanda Joe for helping me put some of this together. We didn't get to the hotel last night till midnight uh, and I was up at 5 a.m. today getting stuff ready. So it's uh, it's it's been a fun trip. It's been exhausting. And uh, if I was able to get closer to the eruption or collect samples or do some of the things I'd like to do, I would consider extending my stay if I could. 
um, but it's right now it just doesn't look like that's that's likely or at least I don't know when that would occur so I am gonna head back home and I've got some other things that I have to be home for so we'll just continue to monitor this moving forward um, let's go ahead and just look at how this thing started uh, right now you can see some of the views here this is a view of the spatter cone the current eruption uh, here's the radio transmitter towers to the west of the Grindavik. This is the western side. Here's the defensive berm. Uh, there is lava out on this flow field, which just might not be uh, obvious right now. But if we go back in time a few hours, you can see some of these hot spots here uh, along the flow field. Let's find a good spot here. Yeah, you can see a few of these orange glows here uh, along this flow field not sure right now if it's advancing at all if it's actually progressing and with the the flow diminished to some degree at the vents um, as the lava flow gets longer if you don't maintain that supply it's harder for the lava to advance as much now it can move through tube systems uh, there's other things that can happen but in general that that's generally pretty true so this is and uh, shout out to viewer Bruce Garner as this was happening yesterday and I was seeing little clips of things I kept thinking oh if only I had that clip and this clip and Bruce read my mind and actually sent me a compilation of some webcam clips that show various parts of the eruption so this is actually um, the initiation of the eruption so there's the uh, fissures and the spatter cone from the March 16th eruption and we might speed this up a little bit just uh, in the interest of time but what we should see here is the initiation. So remember when these things start to uh, erupt, so we'll focus on this area here, and we're looking northeast here, that the gases will come out of the fissures and cracks first. So those volcanic gases will emanate. You can see it getting a little bit more robust right here. Um, more gases coming out, so that will always precede the onset of the lava erupting. So now there's some orange there. So now we've got actually now it's fountaining and the eruption has begun. Uh, and I think at some point the camera zooms in on this. I've got another view I'll show you here in a second that shows the same onset of the eruption. So now the eruption's begun and the fissure starts lengthening in this case to the northeast and to the southwest. So along that pre-existing weakness, that crack or fracture in the ground that the magma has chosen to follow, um, the fissure gets longer and starts lengthening. And let's see if we can skip forward a little bit here. Just jumping ahead a bit. Yeah, so you can see it's starting to lengthen here, uh, especially watching this, this right side here as it comes towards the, the southwest. You can see it pushing a little bit further there. There's our zoomed in view, a little nicer. Fountains, I think they were up to about um, maybe 70, 80 meters, 200 feet or so. Um, so it's pretty spectacular there watching the onset of this just a little bit before 1 p.m. yesterday, local time. And so that's the bulk of that clip. And then let me take you to a couple other ones. This is a different view. Uh, thanks again to Bruce for sending these. Uh, you, you saved me a lot of work, <laughs> which I needed because I got to I got to get to a flight soon. So, um, okay. So this is a different camera view, live from Iceland view, from I think Hagafelt, looking again northeast, paying attention to this area of degassing coming up here. There's our little spatter cone. And if we just bump forward a little bit on this one, we should eventually see that gas area. Yeah, start to, let's go back a bit there. So it looks like it's right there, right behind the spatter cone. The eruption's probably begun. Yeah, I can see a little bit of orange there. And then when you zoom in, you can see the fountaining begin. And that lava, which has been under pressure, coming up, gases are pushing the magma out through that narrow conduit, probably only half a meter or less, and the eruption begins, and there's the fire fountaining. So there it is lengthening over time. They probably have to pull back the camera here to get it all in. Oh, maybe they just stay there. 
Um, so there's this clip. Very nice. Yeah, and then they pull back a little bit as that, that fissure lengthens in each direction. Looks like it's about to start on this end with the, you can see some of the uh, sulfuric gases coming out, this bluish haze. And you can also see the now it's feeding this flow, which is flowing over this lip right here. So it's now it's inundating and starting to flow over uh, the topography. You can see some of this lava flow here in the foreground. Another tongue right there about to come catch up with it. Really spectacular. Um, so there's this clip and then we have, and again this is a bit uh, scattered so I apologize for the random nature of this at the early hour. This is the Coast Guard overflight. So this is probably just a few minutes or maybe tens of minutes, there's that central spatter cone for the March 16th eruption, so you can see some of the lava spilling over that. But this shows the extent of the fissure uh, once it was getting going there. A big gas plume uh, drifting off to the, uh, I think that was the southeast. So there's our helicopter view. And again, you know, three and a half kilometer long fissure, that's sizable. You know, at the height of this thing, um, you know, if it was able to maintain this level of volume, it would have been uh, a lot worse. But it, it did subside a lot like some of the last eruptions where it came in you know, roaring like a lion and then. Um, over a few hours, the flow rate did drop, So, but it was pretty significant, and I think it will be interesting to see what the final numbers are in terms of uh, total volume. Trying to get a feel for exactly which direction we're looking there. I think it's swinging around, maybe to, it's looking to the south. Anyway, so there's our helicopter uh, overflight of the fissure. Yeah, that's looking to the south. I can see the coast down there. So that's letting you see more or less the full length or nearly the full length of the vent. That clip's pretty much over. And here are some uh, close-ups of some of the activity. So this is Again, that older, that cute little spatter cone from March 16th, and the fissure basically cutting, bisecting it, um, and then you can see some of the lava spilling over it. So, oh, whoops, I guess I didn't have the beginning of that one. It's a short clip, it's only 14 seconds. So, some nice footage there. And then this is looking further down the flow field, down to the south. And you can see some of the fountaining here. This is actually the toe of Hagafelt. And what you can see here is, I think it takes them a minute to kind of train it, but what you'll see here is the flow pouring over the south end of this hill. Um, and so it's flowing over the steeper topography, so it's moving quite quickly. There's part of the flow coming around the toe of the hill, but then a good section of it moving through right here. So I thought that was kind of a neat view. And this is near the southern end of the fissure system or the vent. There was also apparently, I don't think I have a video of this, but there was a, um, the part of the lava field was going down a fracture, moving to the south towards the town, and apparently either being confined and or pressurized enough that it was actually kind of popping up and pushing lava out just maybe a few um, maybe a few meters or so out of the ground. But it wasn't a vent, it was actually just being forced down through a fracture and then popping up. Um, so we have that one. And I think I have one more for you here. And then we can look at a couple other things. So this is, here's the western side of Gudindavik. Here's the defensive berm. And this just allows you to see how fast uh, that initial lava was quite hot and fluid, and so it was moving quite quickly. 
I think the camera moves around a little bit here. Yeah, so there's the leading edge, the radio uh, naval transmitter towers over here. And so not only was it moving along the berm, but it was actually moving out to the to the west as well. Oops, let's see. There we go. So you can see it burning the moss, kind of moving out that way. And and they did build a berm up protecting the naval towers. So uh, it looks like those defense mechanisms were were put to the test a little bit as well. And as far as I know, those are still doing okay. But there's not been, uh, I don't have all the all the news right now. I did. I do have a bunch of information from Amanda Joe. I haven't. I didn't even have a chance to go through it all because I didn't have. I had a very short window um, before I need to get going to the airport here in a minute. So here's our Met Office update for the for yesterday in the evening, 6:35. Um, the main points here. So the fissure had shrunk down to about two and a half kilometers, so a shorter length of the vent. Um, the two roads that have been compromised as a result of the lava flowing over it. And then there's the eruption of the rate at which the magma was erupting, uh, 1,500 to about 2,000 cubic meters per second. Um, whoops, sorry, touchy laptop. Um, so real quick getting you through this. Uh, fissure extends south of Hagafell to lava flows vigorously from there to mostly to the south and to the west. Lava has flowed over uh, Green de Vickerweg, the road there that goes north-south to meet Thorpjör, and from there on along the defenses to the west of Grindvik and over Nesvik. So that's the other, the road that kind of goes, the back road that goes to the Blue Lagoon. Some of the lava flow that goes to the south goes into a crack to meet Hagafelt and comes up again just north of the ramparts northeast of Grindvik. Um, so model calculations, they are estimating that about 14 million cubic meters of magma has has moved from the storage zone over into the vent area. So remember, we had a total of about 20 million cubic meters of magma. So maybe as much as three quarters or so of the magma that was in storage has come out of storage. Um, so there's not a, there's still some down there, but not as much as are, has already erupted. Uh, rate of deformation has decreased, and then just some different things here with the the hazard map update and such. They did have um, some explosive activity. I think I I don't know if I have a view of that. I oh, I might have a, a quick little view of that um, because there was some contact with groundwater. So some of that magma interacted with groundwater, uh, was close enough to the surface that it became explosive and fragmental and produced uh, much more vigorous explosions. And I think, is it this view? Yeah, I think if I go back far enough on one of these, you might be able to see, maybe it was this one. Um, and the main thing that, that showed up here was there was some, yeah, it might not show up in here, uh, some brown, instead of just seeing these white, mostly steam and gas clouds, you could see a little bit of brown in here. Let's see if we can see anything. And that indicates that the there was interaction with the with the groundwater. So it became a little bit more explosive, uh, maybe widened or reamed out the the vent fracture a little bit. Um, yeah, maybe I didn't go far enough back, but anyway, I'm sure you can find some of those uh, that footage out there on the different news webcams and such. So anyway, so that part a little bit maybe down here, a little bit darker, I believe. So that may that fissure in the foreground might be part of that. Um, so back to yeah the Met Office update. I think we went through that and the earthquakes real quick. So getting to some of the, what it looked like going into that. So if we go, I gotta drag this over, here we go. If we drag this over and then, 
you can just see a, this real strong northeast southwest trend looking back at the last 24 hours um, going into that earthquake or going into the eruption excuse me and magnitude twos so you can see where the clustering is um, right there between Hagafelt and Selingerfelt um, more or less east or slightly southeast of the Blue Lagoon so you can see some of those earthquakes if we add in the ones uh, you get a much more dense view but a clear indication of where the rock is breaking as that magma works its way to the surface so the good news is we had been seeing in weeks past some earthquakes out here those um, that proved to not be the vent and like like most folks thought all along it was going to take that same pathway it's already have where it already has a plumbing system and a, a pathway to the surface and that proved to be the case here so uh, earthquake data and then if we look at the last just maybe 12 hours or so um, nothing right I mean not much we can add in all the earthquakes just a few so really the lion's share of these earthquakes coming uh, in the few hours and minutes preceding the eruption but luckily there was a strong enough seismic signal that they were able to get people evacuated from the Blue Lagoon and Gudindavik uh, probably an hour or two so we had sufficient warning time which is more than we thought we might so and then here I've just selected um, the last basically 24 hours and just to give you a little better view of where those qu quakes had occurred so um, see Lingerfeld is here Blue Lagoon and the power plant so right there was where we saw the eruption take place but then it it, it split down a little bit further as well so and then some of these are these are the twos this is a 2.8 so you can see the size of those earthquakes and then wrapping up here because I gotta get moving this morning you can see the GPS data the steady inflation that we've been experiencing over the past few months and then these last two data points showing deflation so now that we've uh, emptied or largely emptied the magma storage zone of magma as it's come to the surface the ground elevation has dropped considerably um, over maybe 10 centimeters or so about five inches uh, just in the last you know 24 hours or less due to that uh, due to the eruption so um, so that's all I have for now. I need to get on a plane and head back to the States. I've had an amazing trip to Iceland. I will be sure to do uh, a live stream or some other event soon and, and share with you some of the things going on or some of the things I was able to learn and see here in Iceland. But I wanted to put together this quick update and let you know I'm okay. And it was exciting to be here, but it was a little frustrating as well to not be, you know, to be out on the island, which was fantastic but not be closer to the eruption and be able to monitor things the way I normally would. So